Well, the, re the way I uh, found you, uh, Peter, is uh, you had written an article uh, replying to an article by David Brooks on that was entitled uh, Limits of Empathy. Yeah. And so there was a question mark after it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and then I then I uh, wanted to uh, interview you and uh, you and I looked you up on on uh, Wikipedia and it says that you're an American uh, biologist and consultant and complex system scientist and director of the Institute of the Study of Complex Systems. That's correct. Uh, would you like to say more about that, about your background? And well, I um, I, I actually had a, a, a got a, a very unusual uh, PhD that was interdisciplinary that spanned the life sciences and the social sciences with a focus on uh, the theory of evolution as a paradigm for understanding social and political behavior. That, of course, economic, social, and political behavior. That, of course, doesn't sound <laughs> unusual now. But back in 1970, it was still mm. a pretty radical idea. So I, I had an interdisciplinary board, and that was kind of a launching pad for an eclectic career that led me ultimately to the human biology program at Stanford, which is a, an interdisciplinary life science, social science undergraduate major. And so I was ideally tailored, so to speak, for teaching in that program and taught there for a decade. Uh, and then uh, spun off a research institute uh, and and did some uh, very interesting work on the role of synergy as a causal agency in the evolution of complexity. And that's what our approach has been all about as compared, say, with the Santa Fe Institute, which has been focused on physical principles that are drivers of evolution and complexity. And uh, we, in a sense, are the the null hypothesis or the alternative view of how complexity evolves. Ours is very much uh, focused or very much embedded in a, a Darwinian understanding of, of the evolutionary process. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I could say a lot more. All, all of, you know, I've published several books on the subject from the synergism hypothesis in 1983 to most recently, a uh, book called Holistic Darwinism, Synergy, Cybernetics, and the Bioeconomics of Evolution in 2005. And then the most recent book of all was inspired by, if that's the right word, inspired by the appalling events of 2008-2009 when we had the financial meltdown and the, the, the Great Recession. And <clears throat> the upshot of that for me was a personal response in terms of the fundamental principles of, of fairness and social justice. And my newest book published earlier this year is called The Fair Society, The Science of Human Nature, and The Pursuit of Social Justice. And that kind of says it all. I focus on the scientific foundation for the principles of fairness and then elaborate a new social contract uh, if you will, based on the three fairness principles that I identify in the book and and develop. Uh, and then I have a whole set of uh, prescriptions for what to do about the mess we're in that seem ever more relevant, if that's the mm -hmm. right word. Uh, things are certainly not getting better. And so that's how um, I came to empathy, to bring us to the subject here. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, empathy is, of course, an important consideration in uh, fairness and <clears throat> fair what what we'd call fair behaviors. But it's a complicated story. Uh, there's more to empathy and more to fairness <laughs> than than a simple relationship between the two. And so that's a that that could launch us into a long discussion. <laughs> So that's kind of the, uh, that's where, where we're at here. Yeah, so you've uh, written a book about fairness and justice and kind of the evolutionary foundations of, of it. And, and yes. it fits in, uh, in terms of the empathy, uh, you know, David Brooks had written the article, The Limits of Empathy. And I was wondering if you could uh, go into how, what are you understanding him saying in that article? Well, I, I, I think that he... Um, has not yet done enough homework 
my interpretation from the way he phrased it in his column the other day was that he's uh, done a little bit of reading in Steven Pinker's new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which I haven't yet read either. And so I, I, I can't um, you know, speak authoritatively about uh, the relationship between it and Pinker's position on these things. But I expect that from the way he quoted Pinker, there's a certain amount of skepticism about empathy as the, you know, be all, end all, magic solution to all our problems. Uh, and uh, Brooks picked up particularly on a review article done by a um, philosopher. Uh, I'm blocking on his first name now. I think it's Fred Prinz, P-R-I-N-Z, in which he concluded that the evidence suggested that empathy was was a weak reed or a fragile flower, I think was the way Brooks Mm -hmm. put it, uh, in motivating actions. It's all very well to feel empathy toward others, but it doesn't contribute a lot toward uh, actions that uh, manifest a useful response mm-hmm. <laughs> to feelings of empathy. Um, so and he's, he's, my- saying, he's saying that, uh, that there's empathy is a, is a feeling and it's not turning into action. Yeah, that, it, uh, that, it, that, that whenever our, our self-interests are involved, um, empathy doesn't carry much weight. However, Brooks proposes that instead, much more weight, much more um, uh, value can be found in our ethical codes, codes of conduct, military, religious, uh, etc., and that these are the things that really motivate us to act when there is a prescription to respond to a particular condition with helping behaviors, then that prescription, uh, if we have internalized it, uh, is a much more important motivator to action. Um, I, there, seem to be, there seem to be also a component of morality in the sense that uh, uh, empathy is perhaps not a source of morality, but the rules and re- regulations are kind of this sense of uh, foundation for morality. Right, exactly. That it's the codes of conduct that really motivate us to act in different ways, not our feelings about a situation. And uh, so that's his thesis, uh, and I disagreed with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, would you like to go into uh, what kind of what your response was to that? Um. Yeah. Um, briefly, um, I thought that this was an oversimplification um, and that uh, the truth kind of lies somewhere in the middle and that, uh, and that there are a number of factors that need to be taken into account before you make sort of ba- blanket categorical statements. Uh, let me be specific. Uh, one uh, is that that uh, we have much evidence that in many cases empathy does provide sufficient motivation for us to behave in ways that are helping toward others. And I used as an example the many millions of dollars that are uh, contributed anonymously by people who want to help the victims of earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, you name it, tragedies of various kinds, um, and, um, and or <clears throat> to contribute uh, to somebody who is in need, a neighbor or perhaps, without reference to any particular moral code. Um, conversely, um, people are very susceptible to the praise and blame of others, as Darwin put it in The Descent of Man, meaning that we are very much influenced by what other people say we should do 
or what they do, we feel we should be imitating their behavior, not not sort of contradicting their values and their behaviors. And so it's not a formal code of conduct. It's an informal no, a, a norm, a psychological motivator that is very much socially grounded and very much influenced by the people around us. Uh, so we might contribute to some cause locally, say through the church or some organization, not because we feel empathy particularly, but because everybody else is doing it. And so those are sort of the two, you know, alter two alternative extremes, if you will, uh, in terms of the relationship between empathy and our actions, uh, helping actions of various kinds. Uh, so I, I think that that's an important uh, consideration. Another factor that was clearly not taken into account was that there is very strong evidence across every living uh, you know, species, and humans are not an exception, that individual differences are a very important aspect of biological nature. And human variations are not only obvious in our physical differences, but they also occur in our personality differences and our psychological differences. Those are the result of both nature and nurture. It's not a question of genetic determinism, so we're not going down that road. Uh, in fact, it, it, it can be a complicated uh, relationship between the two, but there is very strong evidence in behavior genetics, which is a field I happen to know something about because I did a postdoctoral fellowship in that, that, that there are biologically based differences in such things as our feelings of altruism and helping behavior toward others and nurturance and empathy. Uh, so, so there's, it's partly biological, but also partly cultural uh, and, and learning and, and the, the, the influence of people around us who shape our differences, individual differences in the way we behave uh, and in our, our, our feelings of empathy. So that's an important consideration, you know, the, the fact that there are maybe 20 or 25 percent of us who are totally fairness challenged, empathy challenged. They are so egocentric, so self-absorbed, so insensitive to the needs and interests of others, so callous that that you know, empathy is not is not a word in their vocabulary. And those people are people we have to deal with. And they are exceptions to whatever rule you want to establish about empathy. So that's, an, I think, a very important consideration. And then the other very powerful variable, if you will, in the empathy equation is that we have a very strong evolved biases to differentiate between we and they, them and us, the people who are members of our group, our um, organization, our nation, and those who are um, outsiders or possibly enemies. And our feelings of empathy and our willingness to help others is very much influenced by whether a person is perceived as a as one of us or one of them. And sometimes we rationalize and, and uh, create psychological barriers to uh, perceptions to emphasize the differences between us precisely because we are, want to keep our distance. So there, it's, it's, it's not surprising that uh, many conservatives in our society, Republicans, are, are antagonistic toward uh, the, our safety net and toward Social Security and Medicare because their perception is that that's money taken from people who earned it to support people who are illegal immigrants or drug addicts uh, or wastrels who ought to go out and get a job and who are just you know, mooching off the rest of us. And so that kind of perception creates a barrier to feelings of empathy that is a very serious, very real phenomenon. And it is part of our evolutionary heritage, as I argue in my book. And so it is a very difficult obstacle to overcome. 
So that's kind of a general view of, of the, mm -hmm. the complexities I see in empathy as a, as a uh, motivator for human behavior. Uh, yeah, I, that's going to be part of uh, David Brooks's argument about what is it that motivates our behavior. Yeah. And he was uh, going, saying that uh, he had a series of kind of arguments that he was, or kind of, uh, kind of qualities that were motivators. And it seemed that like duty was a, a, a motivator, uh, guilt was a motivator, uh, shame was a motivator. And uh, it's it's along the line. He had the uh, story of the of the Nazi soldiers yep. who were shooting uh, Jews, and that they were crying uh, and in distress when as they were doing it. And he said, "Well, they felt empathy for uh, the people that they were killing, but they went ahead and did it anyway." So he was seeing that as a. Uh, is kind of like a, an end to empathy. You know, the empathy isn't strong enough to have them stop and and uh, not do the act. And they were probably, I would imagine that their one of their motivations for doing it was is that they were ordered to do it. Right. And the, they had, the, the Stanley Milgram paradigm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obedience to authority was mm -hmm. is the great is the great work that uh, Milgram did. Uh, back in the 1960s, in fact, and it's still being quoted. So it's obviously been very influential. Yes, it, it clearly other factors enter into our, our feelings of empathy. There may be filters, if you will, or, or variables that affect the, the, the equation, the outcome. Uh, or blocks to empathy. You'd, meant, you'd use the word blocks to empathy. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's other blocks. Um, Sure, and 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 certainly our self-interest is one of them. Uh, if we have a strong self-interest against uh, helping others, maybe we're we are not wealthy and have great a great surplus of wealth to be able to share with others. In which case, empathy may cost us a small amount, but very much at the margin, and it's not really going to, you know, cut from the fat into the bone of our of our. Um, nest eggs. Uh, but if it's somebody who's poor, who's struggling, who's under great stress about where the next meal is going to come from, ask them to be empathetic toward somebody else and to share what little they have. And that's a tougher call. So our self-interest and the context that we are in can very much influence uh, our, our, our responses to things like that. Um, uh, it's it's very difficult to know what s the specific examples Brooks were mm -hmm. was using um, c how those can be explained because yeah. you only have a fragment of the information about that and and who knows it may have been only one guard who was crying and all the rest were not so you know you yeah. gotta be careful about those kinds of anecdotal uh, pieces of evidence. You don't know the story behind it. Is it that they were feeling empathy or was there something else going on or right, right. You exactly. know, what was really, what was really happening? Yeah. Um, you know, the exa example of, of, um, uh, context, I think it can be illustrated by the thought that occurred to me, um, yesterday. And that is that, that, the the facts surrounding a situation can very much influence your feelings of empathy and your willingness to be helpful uh, or to, to how you respond to a situation. So, for example, if if a thief breaks into your house and steals something you might feel a little differently about it if the thief was somebody who was in deep poverty, was starving, and was trying to raise some money to feed his children. On the other hand, if the thief broke into your house to get money to feed his drug addiction, you might be a little less 
understanding of the man's motivation, even if though, even though you are not happy about it in either case, but you'd be a little bit more charitable toward the cause and the and the person. Uh, so I think that's you know that kind of is a dramatic illustration. I hope that background sound that's that okay. Not be a problem. Uh-huh. Okay. It it the George will take it. We'll get we'll have a message. Okay. So. So, um, you know, that's, uh, I, I think, a very important consideration. The, uh, the part that I was uh, looking at that kind of uh, came up for me was, you know, you, you talked about self-interest, and it seems that there's a quality of fear underlying self-interest and empathy. I mean, not empathy, but that as we, if we're empathic with someone, which is our kind of basic biological nature through mirror neurons mirroring each other, that one of the blocks is the fear and the anxiety that sh- that closes our focus and openness and receptivity to others. So if you can get make someone afraid that their empathy kind of shrinks to focus on on their self preservation, which is kind of like a biological underpinning of, of perhaps of, of empathy. So yeah. the self interest is a sense that we're biologically wired with that capability for fear yep. and that the fear closes our awareness uh, t- uh, to others uh, and our empathy to others. And in the, in the prison, in the, uh, the, the uh, story, I mean, I can just kind of speculate here of the soldier shooting the Jews, that the Nazi shooting the Jews, that they could have been afraid out of their own fear of self-preservation. Their empathy is uh, reduced and closed. Well, that that might be part of the explanation. On the other hand, uh, the Jews in Germany in that era had become a target of... um, Oops. Can you... Okay, there. uh, I think I lost the connection there for just a second. We're good here. Uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, you have to remember, had already developed a hatred of the Jews who were blamed for the uh, mess that Germany was in and for the, the, the deep depression, economic depression after World War I. The Jews were a kind of conspiracy to undermine the, the Aryan race mm-hmm. in Germany. And so that kind of hostility and hatred was part of the motivational complex, if you will, that uh, almost certainly influenced the behavior of people like the guards in concentration camps. So I, I, th- I think, again, and that's an example, another example of the we-they mm-hmm. syndrome, the fact that if somebody is perceived as an outsider or an enemy, uh, you get a, a xenophobic response as opposed to the ethnocentric response, which is the sense that we are all in this together. Mm-hmm. And so that is, a, again, is a very powerful motivator. And, and you have to watch it at work. When you see people trying to demonize others, you know that that's part of the process of psychological withdrawal and and the and and putting people into a category where they are going to be treated very differently in terms of empathy, fairness, uh, and and related cooperative behaviors. So, so I, I I think that again, you know, this is all speculation about those guards, but yeah, I think that's a I reasonable that. that's a reasonable uh, it, uh, yeah. uh, hypothesis. Let me let me give you another example where it's not a not just a hypothesis. It was it was a dramatic example of a, precisely what you're talking about. Colin Turnbull, a, a British anthropologist back in the 1960s, did an extensive study published in a, a book called The Mountain People of the Eek. The Eek were Afri- an African tribe that had a, a long occupied a hunting and gathering environment uh, in East Africa. I think it was part of Kenya, but I'm a little uncertain about exactly where. And they the government after World War II in the in uh, the 1950s declared their hunting grounds a national park 
removed them to a mountainous area where they had to engage in agriculture, something they were totally unfamiliar with. So they were forced into a totally different economic system in an area that was unsuitable for agriculture, really. It was a very uh, harsh and relatively barren environment. So the odds were against their being able to succeed at this. They were just thrown to the wolves, so to speak, and were not allowed to go back to their old hunting territory. Well, in this context, um, the, the society broke down. It became a Hobbesian world of every man for himself. You know, people wouldn't help their neighbors or their friends or even their family. Children were allowed to die of starvation. Um, there was a lot of hostility and spite among the people living in the, in, the, uh, in the community. So that kind of extreme stress and anxiety produced an extreme response of antagonism and a complete withdrawal of empathy. So, I, I, you know, this to me is, is a, a very powerful example of uh, the dangers of the kind of situation we are in as a society now where uh, some 25% or 30% of our people are living in more or less severe poverty. That's an underlying source of the stresses and the conflicts that are emerging in our society today um so, so you're feeling that the the uh within society if 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 that many people are living in in poverty that that creates this uh sense of of maybe anxiety and self-interest right. you say you become right. very like oh, i have to take care of myself because i'm in this great stress right right exactly uh, and 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 a, a withdrawal of support for the norms and and uh, principles and laws that support the haves. Uh, John Rawls, in his book, pointed this out. He said, "If you expect, you know, if you expect people to support the a system that benefits you, you better, in turn, in return, support them." Uh, you can't expect the, a one-way um, kind of relationship here. You know, it's a social contract. It's not altruism. You're asking the poor to be altruistic toward the rich. Come on. <laughs> so that uh, that was, I thought, a very powerful uh, argument for uh, the rich being more uh, supportive of the of measures to help the poor. And we've, you know, in the history, gosh, of the, at least the last century, if not the last 2,000 years, reinforces that. I mean, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution were both examples of a, a, a final convulsive response against a system that impoverished the masses of the people, the 99% to pick up on a, a current theme, uh, when the 1% are enormously wealthy uh, and have surpluses far beyond what they need. Uh, so we are, we are entering very dangerous ground in terms of social peace uh, and the legitimacy of the political order in the eyes of a great many of our citizens. Uh, and, and, and uh, oh gosh, there's just a huge amount of work on, on uh, that relationship. Plato was the first pointed out in uh, uh, you know the the Republic that there is a, a war between the rich and the poor and that uh, it is the greatest cause of social conflict and turmoil and revolution of any of any of the causes. Uh, religion, you know, is 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 not r relevant or ethnicity compared to economic disparities. So it sounds so, like you're seeing the the conflicts within society, especially between uh, in the United States between the rich and the poor, and how that's kind of fraying the society, right. and that we right. need to take some kind of action to uh, remedy uh, this uh, yeah. maybe alienation within the or or the conflict, the anxiety, and the alienation within uh, within our society and. And what uh, kind of the approach that uh, we've been looking at is to create a culture of empathy. So uh -huh. how do we actually 
if we're creating a new uh, society, a new culture that remedies some of these uh, problems, that that could be a culture that actually very consciously supports uh, the development of empathy uh, society-wise. Uh -huh. And how would we go about doing something like that? What do we do? I mean, for one, I, it would be like, what's your res your response to the uh, idea of a culture of empathy? And and how would we go about doing creating a, a society like that? Yeah, well, we're moving a little bit beyond my air, uh, comfort zone because mm -hmm. I don't, I, I I don't really have a, a, a lot of background on that. But offhand, I'm going to come across, I think, a little bit as a curmudgeon <laughs> because I really think, in a in a sense, it puts the cart before the horse. If we are if we want to encourage empathy, it is much a much easier thing to do among in a society where everybody's basic needs are satisfied, where there's basic economic and social security. A condition that I remember because I'm old enough, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. And uh, so I know what that kind of a society can look like. It's not a mythical you know, dream in the future. It's a lost it's a lost past history or a, 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 a lost vision that, that we abandoned. We've abandoned the last 40 years. And so, so I believe that put that we, by, uh, dealing with the economic problems, we then create social conditions in which empathy can thrive. Empathy uh, without that is a, is going to be a tough sell for all the reasons we talked about, you know, all of the, 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 the variables that can influence empathy. So I, I, I'm certainly supportive of the, of it in principle, but I, uh, you know, I'm looking for a concrete reform movement. And that's what I kind of have been promoting in my book and, and in the, that blog item that followed the one that we're talking about here today, um, the, the one that I put up yesterday called What's the Big Idea? And the big idea is a new social contract that ensures that the basic needs of all of our citizens, citizens are satisfied, that beyond that we ensure that people are rewarded for merit and not just because they happen to be born rich or because they happen to live on top of an oil well uh, and got rich, uh, but that they deserve the, the wealth that they have. Uh, and third, that there is strong reciprocity, that everybody does their fair share to support our society, and that means top-to-bottom reform of our tax code and, and a much greater public service obligation, which other societies have and which we've had in the past. Gosh, I grew up during the draft and um, volunteered to avoid getting drafted into the Army. So I, you know, and that was accepted as a legitimate duty that all of us had to our country. Um, an alien concept today, but we have to restore that concept that we all owe something to our society, duties and obligations. Otherwise, we are uh, free riders. We're, we're exploiting other the efforts of others if we aren't doing our share in return. So those are the concrete things that have to be done. That agenda, and I have a whole long list of proposals and, and you know changes that I think we could need to make in our society that would then facilitate empathy. Empathy would be almost as much a product of this as a cause. Mm -hmm. Empathy helps, but empathy is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. and the, the way I would put it is that, that depending on the context, empathy may be helpful, and sometimes it may be necessary, but it's definitely not sufficient. You, you're not going to get very far on empathy alone. Um, so the uh, if you're going towards a culture of empathy, the means are not uh, empathy. The, that it it's more like uh, 
creating structures, uh, maybe social structures that uh, distribute the wealth and give everyone kind of a fair, kind of fairness and and right. equality is kind of the way towards. Uh, well, no, I, yeah, e e I, I define equality in a very limited sense as equality with respect to our basic needs. Once those are satisfied, it doesn't mean complete equality. It doesn't mean a complete redistribution of wealth. It means that we just ensure that there is a floor that and that floor is has to be broader than the the way we define the safety net because we have to think about the the more more elaborate set of needs than just food, clothing and shelter and also we have to think about the needs of the reproducing and nurturing the next generation so that greatly expands the concept of basic needs so we all are equal in those basic needs but once those needs are met uh uh oh, I am uh, at a point where my battery level is beginning to. Let me just see what it's I've got. Huh? Yep, I got three minutes left. So, oh. can we take a quick break while okay. I plug this in? So, if, if I understand uh, you correctly, then uh, you're saying that people have these basic needs, and until the basic needs are met, that the empathy. Uh, you know, it's hard to kind of have space for the for the empathy. Yep, I and, think that's a good way to put it. And that, um, well, what about the? Uh, there's kind of like a idea out there that actually one of our basic needs is empathy. That you know, when a newborn baby is you know is born, that the first thing they need is you know the the connection with the mother. And that human connection, and there's the studies, you know, for example, of, of you know, the, the, the monkeys, you know, the baby monkeys going to the furry mother versus to the food. So that yeah. the, the need for that F connection. Famous experiments. Another set of experiments, experiments that's 50 years old. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I'm well aware of them. Yeah. So, uh, it, but it's just a notion that actually one of our basic needs is empathy. In, in that, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess I would uh, it, it question using the word empathy in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, empathy to me means the capacity to mirror the uh, the situation and the emotional state of another human or our dog, for example. Right. A lot of people have empathy uh -huh. toward, their, toward their pets. Uh, and, and, uh, yes, but what you're talking about is a much, uh, broader concept that has to do with affiliation and psychological bonding, uh, imprinting behaviors. Uh, this is a whole nexus of things. And if you collapse all that into empathy, I think you're overselling the concept. Mm -hmm. Um, I, 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 I'd, I'd be real cautious about that. Um, we don't need empathy. Uh, we need uh, social relationships. We need l loving relationships with others. But um, empathy may or may not be an element of that. And maybe that empathy comes along as baggage, so to speak, or as, a, as an ancillary um, bonus mm -hmm. for, uh, in, in a relationship. Um, yeah, there's the problem of uh, definitions that the uh, there's a lot of different ways that the word empathy is used. Yeah, and even among the uh, you know academics who have been studying this for years, they they uh, tend to use the word a bit differently. Um, yeah. yeah, from what I'm seeing though, that there is kind of this understanding of empathy as starting with that. Uh, emotional empathy or effective empathy that you were talking about with uh, mirror neurons, that it kind of goes into a cognitive empathy that kind of relates with perspective taking. And there's also, uh, you know, often talked about as uh, empathic action, that uh, taking the actions, kind of the appropriate actions out of those, uh, both of those experiences. And that's, yeah. that's one thing I'm actually seeing that uh, that David Brooks is kind of not uh, addressing is that whole notion of empathic action and how from the experience of connection 
do we actually go into doing some sort of uh, of an action uh, together? Mm. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it seems that you can't even get into the action without the empathy as kind of that empathic connection to begin with. Um, and well, a lot of cases is the operative word there. I you oh. know a lot of other cases maybe where that isn't true. So yeah. you know the. Uh, you know, m m one of my mentors in graduate school liked to say the truth often runs well in reverse. And it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind before mm -hmm. we, you know, about it, it, most generalizations. But but look, uh, uh, I, again, we're, you're moving beyond my area of competence. Oh, I don't okay. know a great uh -huh. deal about empathy and uh, the psychology of empathy. That's, that's a, a specialized field. And I know there's uh -huh. a ton of books out on it. Actually, I have couple of them on order and I I uh, read uh, Franz de Waal's book uh, a few years ago and and um, and I'm well aware of the work in animals per maybe that sounds perverse but not so much in humans I've got uh, I, I have uh, colleagues that I've worked with and been in touch with over the years who have been working in, on uh, uh, the phenomenon of cooperative behavior and affiliative behavior in uh, many other species, uh, especially the primates. And <coughs> excuse me. And there's a lot of evidence that the rudiments of the kinds of behaviors and emotions that we talk about in humans can also be found uh, quite extensively in the natural world and that it, far from the nature red and tooth and claw com competitive model, the vast majority of relationships, especially in primates, is is cooperative, affiliative, uh, something I, you know, between 80 and 90 percent. And so there's a lot of good data showing that the foundation for the kind of emotional states and relationships and, and behaviors in humans it, it goes back not only in our own evolutionary heritage, but is also found quite widely in social species in, in uh, the rest of nature. And so, so uh, you know, I am entirely sympathetic to the notion that empathy is an important emotional uh, quality in humans and that it does play a, a significant role in our behavior and it helps motivate us to do things that are beneficial toward others um, as a generalization. But I am also aware of some of the complexities and, mm, yeah. and that's about it. As, as far as I can go in terms of being informed on the subject. Right. So the kind of the area that you really focus on is on the biology and, and, and the, how, how would you say, or what is the, the really the specialty that you have of knowledge? It's called fairness is my fairness. specialty. Fairness. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and that has, <clears throat> that has an emotional property, but I am much more focused in my work and especially my book uh, on the both for the procedural aspects, <clears throat> excuse me, of fairness, uh, and the substantive elements of fairness. Uh, I define fairness simply as an aspect of the relationships between any two people or among large numbers of people, uh, and it has to do um, with whether or not we are accommodating to, recognizing, accommodating to, and trying to strike a balance among the varying interests and needs uh, and and uh, stakes of different uh, people, the the people who are involved, uh, the stakeholders in any kind of situation. So uh, I'm much more focused on the concrete, practical issues related to that mm -hmm. uh, and my understanding of the evolution of it and and the psychology of it is is derivative from uh, the economic and political consequences uh, in, in, and and that's what I write about in my book so you are you're uh, stretching me here uh -huh, right uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to, to, uh, when it comes to being uh, an authority on empathy, I mm. definitely uh, defer, de demure on that or defer, <laughs> whichever. Uh, well, how do you see then the relationship between uh, fairness and empathy? Kind of how do those two qualities relate to each other? Well, empathy helps. 
<clears throat> but again, it's 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 not sufficient, and it may not be necessary. Um, <clears throat> a in a court of law, somebody who is um, totally antagonistic to the other person's point of view, the court may decide that uh, you have to pay alimony or you have to pay damages for what you've done. And that person may not think it's fair. Mm -hmm. They may be hostile to the other, to the, their, the, the other person, but the court has determined there is a social process that has determined that fairness requires us to do things. And so fairness can exist without any feelings of empathy whatsoever. Right. Uh huh. I see. On the other hand, there are many, many, many cases where we, our actions are motivated in considerable measure by feelings of empathy toward those who are in need and those reinforce social norms, the expectations of others, um, codes of conduct, uh, taxes, <laughs> tax uh, uh, bills that we receive from the IRS, and so forth. So, so e empathy definitely plays a role in fairness, but fairness is something that has a very uh, um, uh, concrete um, process that 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 involves uh, the relationships between people fairness is about relationships um and what we think is fair very often others don't think is fair mm -hmm. and, and so compromises between my view of fairness and your view of fairness uh, may be necessary um but empathy may not play a role at all in that mm-hmm uh, that's maybe not as helpful as you would have liked, but uh, that's kind of the approach I've been taking, which is why I, I find empathy uh, a factor, and, and certainly do mention it in the book, but it is not the focus of my book on fairness. Mm -hmm. I see. So, the, yeah, the, uh, I, I, I've, uh, I scanned through your book, the search uh, on empathy, and I saw that you'd uh, mentioned the empathy. No, no. no, which book are you talking uh, about? Your most recent one. Um, it's on called The Fair Society. Fair, Fairness, Fair Society. Yeah. And you'd mentioned the empathy altruism hypothesis. Uh-huh. And I don't know if, you're, if you recall that. And I believe uh -huh. it, I had heard it from uh, Daniel Batson, who is a uh -huh. professor yeah, has studied empathy at the uh, University of Kansas, and as I understand it, he's saying that there's there's this notion of of uh, the social exchange theory uh, in society, which seems right. to be kind of around fairness. It's like I exchange, I give you, and mm -hmm. then he also has the empathy altruism hypothesis, saying that if people have an empathic connection, they shift into a different relationship which is based on kind of more of a empathic uh, connection with each other mm -hmm. and if that breaks down that they kind of revert back to uh, kind of the fairness or the the social exchange uh, way of relating yeah well I yeah I, 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 I do I do agree um, but uh, fairness goes vastly beyond feelings of empathy and, and very often uh, may be at issue without empathy being a factor at right. all. Uh -huh. So I want to be clear that uh, empathy is, is, an, is a significant influence, uh, but, but uh, is definitely not um, sufficient uh, to support uh, fairness. Um, and, and, and certainly the, the feelings of empathy also have to be differentiated from, uh, the, the principle of reciprocity. Uh, there is a lot of work in evolutionary psychology, particularly the work of Lita Cosmides and, and John Tooby on social exchange, which reinforces what anthropologists have discovered, Donald Brown's book on human universals, documented that every known society, down to the smallest, 
uh, is, among other things, uh, imbued with a sense of reciprocity, that repaying a favor, uh, doing your fair share, and so on, are very important social motivations. To me, that's independent of, of empathy. You do it because you have a feeling that you are obliged to pay somebody back. You don't feel comfortable if you owe somebody. Uh, and conversely, somebody doesn't feel comfortable with you if you haven't shown a sense of reciprocity. They feel exploited. So that's a, that's a different kind of psycho, psychological demand, uh, dynamic. And feelings of empathy may contribute to that. But again, it's not the same thing. It's, it's a different kind of psychology. Uh, so uh, empathy and altruism are very important in our relationships, no doubt. Um, reciprocity is also very important in our relationships. Um, and, uh, so is the, the sense of, of merit of, uh, equity. If mm -hmm. somebody else takes credit for something that I have written or done, or invented, um, I feel exploited, abused. I feel it's unfair. That's why uh -huh. we have a patent office, among other things. I mean, if, among other reasons for having a patent office is because it enables people to protect their creative products. Uh, yeah. So if you've written, if you've written something and someone else has taken that and said, "Oh, I wrote it," and it yeah, kind of usurped it you would feel some sort of pain from that or, or well and the and, and, or... and, and others other yeah exactly and and uh, and others would too i mean plagiarism is something i remember a historian i won't mention her name a few years back was caught plagiarizing from some er earlier books i mean just taking whole sections and you know she that cost her her career uh so so uh, you know, taking up from others without giving them due credit, mm -hmm. much less compensation or rewards of various kinds for, for what they've done, uh, is, is also a part of our psychology. And that's independent of, of uh, empathy. But we could may, I just we, add one part here? Is, is it not that you're, you're feeling, uh, in a sense, like hurt or pained in some way because the person didn't empathize with you, they didn't put themselves in your shoes to see that, oh, if I do this action, it will have this, it will cause this pain to this person. So in, in, in a sense, well, it, it's like... It, 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 no, 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 it, uh, that, you know, that, that may be a helpful sort of subtext, if you will, but the, but the real issue here is whether or not somebody is exploiting me, taking advantage of me, and not uh, empathizing with you. No, no, no. The, the empathy the, the the empathy may be may be nice, but I, I don't care whether the person sympathizes with me or not. He stole my what what belongs to me, my property, and and so it's it's a much more um, one related to the psychology of uh, what for lack of a better term, we call equity of merit or demerits for that matter, uh, being punished for your transgressions. Okay. And, and, so, and, and that can be right. done. And that's independent of empathy. Right. Uh, you it, know, again, empathy helps, but I, that's, uh, that's not the central yeah. dynamic here. And it's not the central psychological phenomenon. I, I, if I feel exploited by somebody else, um, I don't think about whether he's lacks empathy. I just know I've been hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's done damage to me. And I, I, I am, f I feel that is unfair. So yeah, if, if you, know, you can make what you want of it, but, uh -huh. but, I, but we're, but we're operating in different spheres here. And I think those two are, are, uh, N don't always fit together. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really, yeah, it's really kind of the relationship of fairness and empathy and, uh, yeah. And like, how do they relate? You know, how are we, how are we looking at that? And, you know, if, if you're walking out on the street and somebody comes up and just robs you, I mean, you feel like you've been kind of taken advantage of and, yeah. And, uh, 
and you and you you see that oh this this is not right what has been done here as I understand it or this is not fair, right right. Uh, so yeah well look uh, uh, I, I'm looking at the time here. Okay think, yeah this is great. But so. but, but, let, but let me let me just uh, put a cap on this. Yeah thanks. Uh, by by saying that I think the work you're doing on on empathy is very important. I'm con- going to continue to work on fairness. I'll certainly be keeping empathy in mind as I do further work in this area uh, because I certainly think it is an element and, and it helps w- to lubricate uh, uh, fair behaviors. Uh, if we can understand others' needs, then we are more likely to be responsive to their their claims and to act in fa- ways that are fairer. So I don't want to discount at all the role of empathy, but I, but fairness is a is a phenomenon and has dimensions, concrete dimensions that are definitely independent of how we feel about them. So that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh huh. Okay, Peter, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, do this uh, interview and have this chat and kind of explore these these ideas and these experiences. And I really enjoyed it. And right. I hope we can keep in contact in in uh, the future too. Well, so. and and good luck with your project. It sounds mm-hmm. like a very important, useful thing to be doing. So take care. Okay. Thank you very much.